Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Argyle Executive Forum webinar. And uh, today uh, we're going to introduce our thoughts uh, on the live or virtual event marketing format debate, um, which is the right format and, and why. And uh, we're going to do that in the context of uh, what we think are the most important and uh, relevant contexts, particularly when it comes to uh, thinking about your target buyers, whomever they may be, and the role that event marketing should be playing uh, in helping you uh, build your business and continue to develop uh, both your brand's reputation and your business's uh, overall new business pipeline. Having said that, today what I'd like to do is go through uh, a brief uh, look at the big picture, uh, those things that uh, currently act as uh, important dynamics when it comes to thinking about event marketing strategy in particular and the ongoing challenge of lead generation uh, for marketers such as you in the B2B marketing world um, as it concerns those things that affect the typical B2B buyer. That said, uh, I'm going to then segue into a discussion about which of the event formats work in which contexts and why, and uh, not necessarily by way of comparison uh, as one over the other being better or worse, rather that they are different. Uh, and for that reason, uh, they have different roles. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the way in which those differences uh, can be used to your advantage in thinking about your event marketing plans uh, in the near future. And then finally, uh, a little bit of time on what to do next. Uh, what are the things that you should be thinking about, the action steps that you can take as a result of this relatively quick presentation? Uh, we aim to finish in under 30 minutes or so, and uh, I hope that by the time uh, you've spent uh, in enjoying this presentation, uh, you have your opportunity to both uh, reach out to us, should you wish, uh, as well as ask any questions that may be uh, of mind as a result of what you hear today. So without further ado, it's an understatement, of course, to say that B2B sales and marketing is rapidly evolving in my relatively lengthy career in one marketing services role or another in the course of my some years. Um, I have never quite seen the pace of change, much less the scale of change that's going on. And uh, it is uh, in particular in a couple of areas that I think that are very relevant to thinking about event marketing and uh, reaching B2B buyers in particular. And the first of those, of course, is the advent of working from home as a consequence of uh, the disruptive uh, nature of COVID some years ago. But nevertheless, now it seems that we are settling into a, a pattern of significant changes to your buyers and users' lifestyle as a result of this phenomenon of working from home. And I think the point of this chart is to uh, address what I think is a widespread misunderstanding uh, that it is uh, the uh, it is the the focus of some industries more so than others that working from home affects. However, what this chart I think is very well illustrating is that regardless of industry, more importantly, if you're a white collar worker, if you're in the information business when it comes to your career or profession, regardless of what industry you might be, the likelihood is that you are very, very likely to be working from home. In fact, up to 40 odd percent of those of us that have careers in the information management role, 
uh, white collar working roles, uh, as they're typically known, uh, are most likely to be the ones working from home, regardless of whether I'm in a manufacturing industry uh, or a wholesale trade uh, or any other number of different. The likelihood is, is that because of the nature of your work more so than the industry, you become a very eligible candidate for that uh, for that uh, way of life. And what is very important to note is that for those of us uh, in the 20s, 30s and 40s, uh, we are much more likely to be spending time at home or in a hybrid uh, situation. Now, uh, it's, of course, uh, important to note that these are generic numbers uh, allocating across a very large average. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, clearly, uh, it's important to note now that uh, both from a professional standpoint in white collar industries or white collar roles, I should say, and amongst those of us born since 1980 uh, or, or, or more recently, the likelihood is, is that there's a good number, if not the majority, who would be working from home. Now, this, of course, has enormous impact when it comes to thinking about having people attend events. Uh, and it starts to set up the importance of virtual events as relevant uh, ways of providing access to folks in these circumstances. But I'm going to talk about that some more very shortly. Uh, the corollary of this enormous demographic shift uh, taking place in the United States, as well as many other developed markets, uh, is this extraordinary shift in workplace culture and behavior uh, as we see uh, the migration of baby boomers and those older leave the workforce. And now the vast majority of uh, professionals uh, managers and workers uh, in the today's workplace are people that have been born since the year 1980. Uh, now, this, of course, coincides with the advent of the Internet era, and uh, the importance of this is uh, illustrated in one very important way by the incredibly important role of social media in both the culture and behaviour of folks uh, in these age ranges. And so thinking about your target buyers and the likelihood that they fall within these age ranges and the likelihood also by virtue of this uh, chart to, the, to my right that illustrates just how significantly social media has become a part of their lives. We think about then the use of that as a marketing channel to reach them as compared to many other traditional channels, which are still uh, the focus of uh, behaviour amongst anyone born before 1980, but largely very increasingly less relevant uh, to those born since. So demography is having an enormous impact on in consideration of how we start to think about event marketing and the way in which we can use event marketing to reach uh, this uh, the, these these uh, very important changes. I think one very, very important uh, change as well to think about is the way in which the sales model itself has evolved uh, since COVID. Um, and uh, with AI to come, by the way, and I'm not going to spend any time on that, but clearly there's a lot going on there. I just draw your attention to this a uh, very important piece of data, and in particular to the right, this dramatic change in the uh, likelihood of organisations deploying field sales teams or in-person sales teams. This is a significant shift, uh, and by way of anecdotal uh, evidence uh, in consultation with uh, many of our different clients, very consistent in the change in which organisations have gone about rethinking the sales model, not just because of COVID, but since COVID and the many other sort of economic pressures that organisations find themselves under, thinking about the way in which through technology, through different processes, through marketing automation, through artificial intelligence, 
which, as I said, is already having some impact. The very, uh, the very idea of somebody uh, in a field sales role uh, is increasingly in question from a management perspective. And um, worth bearing in mind that the assumption that that is the case going forward uh, is an assumption to question depending on your target buyer and uh, the relationships that you have with them. A corollary again of all of the above is the increasingly group nature of the B2B buying process. Uh, in this uh, set of data from Gartner uh, recently published, um, this shares uh, the allocation of time the average B2B buyer is uh, spending in various duties in the course of it. And uh, you can see how uh, significantly the percentage of time that they are allocating to meeting with their buying group, nearly a quarter of it, uh, in addition to then researching independently offline, researching independently online, not sure what other might encompass, but leaving only about a sixth of their time, about 17%, to, to, to meet with potential suppliers. And this, again, reinforces uh, how important, when we think about your target buyer, the question of the time investment they're prepared to make in engaging with potential suppliers uh, becomes. And so anything that presents itself as more efficient or anything that helps optimise the time they spend with uh, you or your partners is something to be very uh, considerate of. And so it makes complete sense that the correlation of different culture, different behaviours, group buying processes, uh, advent of a variety of other different uh, dynamics inside the average organisation would present uh, a buying decision process, which is much, much more complex than we give it credit for. And at the risk of overstating uh, this point, that the more contributors make buying decisions much more complex. And so we, we have to be uh, very, very careful choosing what it is uh, we do by way of our marketing and lead generation efforts to take advantage of the right moments inside the complex processes such as this to ensure that event marketing can play the role that we know it's capable of playing, but doing so in a way which is the most relevant and impactful uh, as a result of the investments that you're making. Of course, the pipeline is still uh, the most important priority, uh, long and away past uh, those other things that the average CMO, when asked uh, what is more important for their B2B marketing and sales goals, pipeline growth remains overwhelmingly the number one issue. And it's important to also observe that when it comes to thinking about the way in which I can go about getting more market share, the data now is very, very convincing and very, very strong across multiple reports and sources that those folks that gain the most market share are the folks that are using the most sales channels. Um, this really, when we think about uh, the changes in people's behaviors, in their lifestyles, the demography, all of the things that I've talked about in the previous few charts point to the, the importance of being able to diversify uh, your marketing and sales messages for the benefit of reaching folks whose media behaviors and lifestyle changes make it extremely hard for them to reach in any given one channel. Um, and also, as equally because it's imperative that we start to diversify the number of marketing channels that we use, that we think very clearly about the difference in role that each of these marketing channels need to play. Some of them are better than others in 
certain respects. And so with that in mind, we need to think very carefully about the role of event marketing and the role of the different formats that event marketing has the opportunity to use. Event marketing is still a very high priority. We, we survey our uh, customer base, which is extensive and across many, many industries uh, regularly. And it is not uh, unusual to see very, very high positive inclination for uh, use of event marketing as a marketing channel uh, amongst um, our customers and reflected in many other surveys of equal weight uh, from different perspectives. And uh, what is extraordinarily important to note is that uh, a phenomenon uh, of uh, event marketing and in particular uh, in the ca court case of the, the last few years since COVID is the advent of virtual events hybrid events with the ongoing role of in-person events now that in-person events can be conducted as freely as they used to be able to. And this is a snapshot of a survey taken only about six months ago. So pretty recently to say that future events uh, from the point of view of uh, the different formats is something that is being considered in these weights uh, going forward. Um, now, the question is, why choose one over another? And I hope to resolve that question with you by just thinking a little bit more uh, tactically as well as uh, more in more granular detail about the different formats and the way in which uh, they play a role. So I thought it's very important that we take uh, a pause because from Argyle's perspective, the most important uh, context in which to consider this question is, of course, mapping out the buyer's journey. Most organisations that we deal with, and I would expect most of you on this call today, um, are thinking very, very carefully about the different stages of your buyer's journey and the way in which your buyer behaves and thinks and feels at each of those different stages from discovery through to selection, through the purchase process, and then finally uh, ongoing commitment with you, hopefully uh, in, in whatever brand, product or service you have to offer. And um, it is very much uh, important to think about the different context that the buyer is going through in each of these phases because they do differ. There is different types of information and different goals that are being sought at each stage. And this has a good deal to do with what sorts of marketing tactics are going to be most relevant, particularly when it comes to event marketing. The sorts of stage uh, contexts that at a discovery stage involve gathering information, much more broad scope, uh, is very, very different to the selection stage in which we're starting to shortlist, we're starting to test different product alternatives. Uh, and the scoping is becoming quite narrow. Uh, when we get to purchase, we're in a very much different phase again, where we're involved in negotiating. We've got certain trade-offs being made. This is a very much more transactional phase in the process. And then finally, once having made a commitment, we're in the execution phase. There's some level of debugging to go on, whether that's uh, an application in particular of yours, or it's uh, a process regardless, it's a useful term to use. But the buyer is very much invested in this process. And to some extent through that investment, uh, there is a little bit more at risk. There's a great deal of heightened uh, 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 feeling about making sure that their purchase decision is successful. So. These are, we think, very important contexts to consider. Um, and likewise, this is when event marketing goals start to change. In the discovery phase, our view is that that's when lead acquisition becomes very, very important. Ideally, event marketing is supporting the role of finding prospects for you that are in that phase and making sure that they become part of your early funnel or pipeline in when they're in the selection phase and we can pre-qualify 
uh, people who are uh, potential targets of yours, we want to do our very best in supporting lead qualification in that phase by having events which uh, have the opportunity for more interaction and more information sharing between yourself and the target buyers. In the lead conversion phase, uh, clearly when people are in the purchase process, we want to do our best to help make sure that the uh, event experience is facilitating circumstances which the right people are in the right room together uh, and uh, facilitating the process of purchase. And finally, in the commitment phase and, and in the ongoing sense, we want to make sure that event marketing is offering an experience in which relationship building can continue uh, in order for the relationship to be as successful as you'd like it to be. This is a way in which we think in very broad terms about how we put event marketing plans together. And I thought now I'd share with you um, the thought of what are the essential differences that we see between virtual and live and how do we use those differences to place them in a plan to work for our, our, our clients. Virtual is clearly a very cost efficient approach. Um, it, it does not bear the burden of venue costs, catering costs, travel costs, and many of the other things that a live event does. And clearly that's an incredibly important advantage for those of you who are pressed in terms of budget as we all are these days. Uh, and thinking about what can I do that is a very, very cost efficient way of generating leads. Also, content versatility is an edge that virtual events do have, if, if only marginally, but it's important to note that staging a virtual event is something that we can do in a relatively short period of time um, and requires not a little bit less than the sorts of pre-production processes that a live event does. It doesn't change the nature of the content that can be created and carried for both formats, but there is a little bit of an edge when it comes to that just by virtue of the flexibility of uh, the format, uh, the virtual format. Virtual is clearly very, very accessible. It is geographically totally neutral. Uh, it really has no limits in terms of its bandwidth. Uh, it can carry hundreds or thousands of attendees if necessary depending on the nature of the topic. That doesn't make it the right thing to do in all cases. Uh, and I wanna stress again that there are differences in these formats, not one is better than the other. Um, but when it comes to accessibility, particularly for folks who are working from home who can be up to 40% of the working population, depending on industry and location, this becomes a very, very important idea. There is, uh, a, another very important advantage in virtual in its ability to have content that it creates, repurposed and reused because inherently virtual formats are typically recorded. Uh, the technology used to convey them lends itself to this capability very much so. And we find ourselves spending a lot of time with our clients recutting and repurposing the content that these formats, uh, these uh, virtual events create because it's very, very useful content after the event and in an ongoing sense. Now, of course, you can do the same thing with a live event, but recording in live events uh, is a little bit more uh, precarious depending on the sorts of speakers you have, the venue itself. It adds a great deal to the cost and complexity of staging an event. Um, and it isn't quite as straightforward uh, as, a, 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 as a result of those things. So repurposing and reusing content is an enormously important difference. Clearly, live events are at the foreground when it comes to personal networking. And this, of course, is immensely important. It's immensely important in terms of helping introduce uh, your sales team or your ambassadors, as the case may be, at events to establish perhaps what are the preliminary stages of a relationship or in reinforcing some relationships which are already exist uh, that you see an opportunity to use live events to have that relationship reinforced through personal interaction. So clearly that's something that uh, live events need to be thought about. Li uh, virtual events have to some extent personal networking capabilities, 
um, but they're nowhere near as enriched uh, as a result of a live event. There is an inherent flexibility in virtual events, speaking to the earlier advantages of virtual over live by virtue of its format. I won't dwell on this except to say that that's something to take in mind when it comes to thinking about uh, tactical uh, spur of the moment decisions or needs that need to be met that you uh, want something to come to uh, to the market in a relatively quick way, uh, a virtual event is so much easier and more flexible to put together in a shorter time frame. And then finally, I think it's fair to say that both virtual and live are equally strong in their ability to convey the brand experience that you want whether it's uh, via a virtual event and staging the user experience the way your brand needs to be conveyed or it's in the in in the context of a live experience uh, and uh, having speakers and content and material do what they need to do to present your brand in the best light so as arbitrary as some of that seems at least uh I thought it would be important to try to be a little bit more granular about the many differences of the two formats. And let me put all of that together for you by way of what we think is a, an optimum way to align uh, the different formats for the different stages of your uh, buyer's journey. And so we think in terms of our product offering, uh, as being most useful aligned according to uh, whether discovery, selection, purchase or commitment are the various stages at which we expect to go out and recruit your prospects and convey uh, the sorts of content or experience that helps inspire them uh, to get engaged with you. And so our virtual forums or our live summits are the ideal product for helping um, generate leads of 100 to 300 in our case that we would guarantee uh, and uh, so help uh, generate leads who may well be in the discovery phase. Um, we think that when leads uh, are needed uh, of folks who are at the selection phase, a custom event becomes a little bit more relevant, whether that's live or virtual, uh, we think both can serve the purpose um, and there's also a capacity to create one of both by introducing streaming capabilities so that they are hybrid and this is when we can showcase on your behalf brand and product content that is starting to fulfill the needs of buyers who at this stage are looking for the best con candidates to fulfill their RFP we would typically expect to be able to generate 50 to 200 odd 50 leads, depending on format and uh, location. Webinars, we think, are the most important workhorse of our uh, event capabilities. Um, they are extremely uh, cost effective and efficient in their ability to reach out to folks who are in the selection or purchase process. They give you the opportunity to make your pitch in a format which is increasingly uh, very, very familiar to anybody in the B2B marketing, sales and buying process. Um, and we uh, typically expect to guarantee 100 to 150 leads uh, from the webinars that we generate, uh, which we produce many, uh, some hundreds uh, throughout the year on behalf of many different clients. Our executive workshops are formats in which a smaller group is brought together who may well be in the purchase and commitment phase in which they're looking to explore in more detail how your particular application and cases that are relevant to your application can be brought together. And we typically see 20 to 30 odd leads generated out of uh, this experience where it's facilitated in an interactive setting, uh, offering clients of ours and their prospects the opportunity to be highly interactive and highly engaged uh, in a stage in which they're thinking about being very granular uh, about your product uh, or your application. And then finally, 
uh, in the commitment stage or as close to the purchase phase as perhaps possible, we see a very important role in our executive dinners. We uh, stage literally hundreds of executive dinners annually, uh, which are typically live, which are typically moderated, uh, obviously live uh, in staged in very uh, premium dining experiences. Um, these are experiences we typically see our clients reserve for VIP prospects and customers um, and uh, typically confined to 10 to 15 uh, leads or existing customers as the case may be. I hope that gives you a sense of our approach, uh, how we try to uh, align on our client's behalf the different formats according to the stage at which uh, the prospect is in their part in their buying process and how uh, that can be uh, translated into what in in in, in effect is a ongoing integrated event marketing program that we have clients committing to over several over, over the source of the the, the, the the course of several months to generate a very consistent level of leads, of prospects and potential buyers at various stages in the funnel. Um, and I'd make the point that um, as I highlighted earlier, um, and it's certainly been our experience that our clients' ROIs do approve significantly by integrating events with multi-channel marketing, by enveloping or wrapping, if you will, content marketing, direct uh, email marketing, social media marketing, as we arrange around various events at various stages before, during, and after the event. And we've seen quite significant differences in campaign results uh, because of taking an integrated approach by using more than one channel. Um, and I won't dwell on the specific cases here, except to say that um, going from one-off tactical in investments that will generate uh, a certain number of qualified leads. In this case, uh, 275 leads were generated, of, of which um, 100 leads were converted to MQLs at the rate of some 4%, down to um, a, a, an integrated event marketing program that we conducted on behalf of a client in the enterprise security software business which generated over 500 odd qualified leads, but uh, happily led to a much higher MQL conversion rate of 10%, uh, doubling the difference in uh, an event only approach, uh, and also happily uh, another 10% conversion rate to proposals. So I hope that gives you a little sense of how uh, multi-channel marketing can help uh, by augmenting your overall event marketing approach. And we'd be delighted to share more details of these cases and others, along with thoughts of how we might be able to help you. I hope that as a result of what you've heard today, uh, that you'll be intrigued to contact us. I'd be delighted to take any questions via my email at pprice at argyleforum.com. I do hope that today's webinar has been beneficial to you at least in helping resolve what we think are the important differences between virtual life and the way in which one or the other should be used when it comes as a result of the differences that are inherent with them. And I wish you all the very best of luck in your B2B marketing outlook. Thank you.